doctors we, we are live you can start the session okay so uh, good evening uh, friends uh, we are here once again uh, our last webinar was on 30th april where we spoke about the evo formula and today we are dealing with uh, a very important topic master class on toric intraocular lenses uh, toric lenses actually have become the standard of care most of us uh, perform toric eye surgery as the lens of the first uh, of our first choice unless the patient is not ready to pay for the cost uh, difference so those of us who are on the verge of starting off uh, toric lenses i think will find it immensely useful this particular program and those of us who have been uh, doing toric lenses and still grappling uh, with the initial you know, teething troubles and the intraoperative issues and post op issues they will also find it extremely useful and those of you who have been you know teaching and doing toric lenses for a long time i am sure there will be one or two points uh, take home points for you you know whenever i attend a meeting any 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 meeting at any level i always come back with or come back wise wiser and richer with uh, some additional points so uh, this meeting is being organized by chakrabert eye care center uh, under the aegis of kerala society of ophthalmic surgeons and trivandrum ophthalmic club i am uh, immensely grateful to these organizations for using uh, their banner i also happen to be i am arup chakrabarty from chakrabarty eye care center and i also happen to be the president of ksos and i am representing ksos for this meeting and we have a galaxy of uh, stars you know we have uh, today uh, with us uh, dr harbans lal the vice president of aios and then we have dr chandrashekhar uh, wavikar from thane dr ramesh dr rajan from chennai and dr nirupama baliga uh, from uh, pondicherry so uh, this is actually the topics or the flow of the uh, program today uh, the first uh, talk will be by uh, dr harbans lal talking to, telling us about toric eyewells basics to advance his presentation will be in three segments we will first talk about the basics of toric eyewells then he will deal with toric eyewells in unhealthy cornea situations and then finally problem management you know problem management of complications with toric intraocular lenses and then we will have uh, two very interesting talks uh, by uh, ramesh uh, and uh, chandrashekhar where they will tell us about their seven pearls uh, or more more or more more than that and uh, that i'm sure going to be extremely useful for all of us and then we uh, uh, dr nirupama and myself we will be coordinating the show we have collected a hell of a lot of questions uh, many questions came to my email and many questions were were generated by dr nirupama and i would like to acknowledge uh, the contributions from dr anurag from katak sayan das from kolkata dr rohit om prakash uh, from amritsar dr shreyas uh, ramamurthy from from coimbatore and many other friends who have sent in uh, their you know the queries and nirupam has put all the questions and some additional questions uh, to be dealt with uh, by uh, the fa faculty uh, dr harbans of course does not need any introduction he is our uh, vice president and he has uh, you know held a very important post in all india ophthalmic society in the past as a treasurer uh, two terms and he has brought in whichever organization he has worked for whether it is the delhi ophthalmic society or all india ophthalmic society he has brought in uh, uh, drastic changes you know the things he has thought out of the box and ensured that the society really moves forward uh, and taken steps and measures which have reached out to the the benefits of which have percolated to the grassroots of all india ophthalmic society so i mean uh, there are a lot of uh, things that he has uh, uh, done and he is still continuing to do uh, for me dr harbans lal actually is a fantastic uh, surgeon he is uh, not only a good technician with uh, the tools and the surgery and all that you know but he is a thinking surgeon uh, he is able to analyze each and every step he does and why he does it and he makes the whole process extremely logical and that is the way any any surgery cataract surgery or for that matter any surgery should be so uh, i have listened to him uh, talking on this topic in bits and uh, pieces uh, and uh, today i thought you know we'll have uh, an, an entire talk uh, where he will deal uh, with uh, the the inter gamut enter all the, all the ranges all the possibilities in toric intraocular lenses and uh, so here is dr harbans lal 
And then we have uh, Dr. Ramesh. Uh, he is a good friend from Chennai. He's a brilliant ophthalmologist, brilliant academician, brilliant human being. And he has been teaching all of us over the years over the various social media and, and the various conferences. Chandrasekhar, again, is a very, uh, very dynamic and very brilliant uh, surgeon, thinking surgeon. So he also will be joining us in a short while from now. He's caught up in a traffic jam. The heavy rains happening in Maharashtra. Is he here, Chandrasekhar? No, okay. So then we have uh, Dr. Nirupama. Nirup Dr. Nirupama happens to be from the same uh, college that I passed out from. So she is very junior to me. Her father was my teacher, uh, cardiothoracic surgery, and he was also a former director of uh, Jipmar Pondicherry. So currently Nirupama, though she is a trained uh, uh, pediatric ophthalmologist, she has varied interests and we have done a lot of work together in intraocular lens powers and toric lenses and things like that. And at, at present, she's doing a fellowship. She's in UK now. She's doing a fellowship in orbit and oculoplasty. So with these introductory words, I think we will uh, get going and uh, let's have fun. Over to you, Dr. Harbansh. Oh, can you see my screen? We can see the screen, but uh, we have to open the presentation, sir. Yeah. Is it okay now? Yeah, but yeah, full screen. Okay, thank you, Dr. Aru, uh, for uh, giving me this opportunity and uh, such an, uh, kind words and uh, really grateful for your generosity. And so I will come to the topic, as already mentioned, I'll be covering this topic in three heads, basis of toric eyewell, toric eyewell in a regular cornea, toric eyewell surprise, calculate and correcting the misalignment. So as Arup has already highlighted that if patient can afford and surgeon is confident, all patients above one diopter of corneal axillaries are candidate for the toric eyewells, except if there's a progressive corneal pathology, if they are contact lens user in a regular cornea, if the children below 12 years of age. But even those patients who have got less than one diopter of corneal astigmatism are also candidate for the toric IUL if they are going for multifocal or EDOP IUL. So I will, uh, a patient is going for EDOP IUL, even if it is 0.75, I would like to correct it. If the other eye had a toric IUL with accident results, suppose patient had 1.25 toricity in one eye and after surgery is left with 0.25, the other eye has got 0.75. I think we should still attempt to correct it or bring it to the 0.25. Against the rule estimate is, again, if it is less than 1.9, 0.8, one can go for the toric IVL. And even if the patient's the toricity is 0 0.75, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, but is effective error, that means if he's using the specs of say 1.5, 1.25, probably he's also a candidate for the toric IVL. So this is most rewarding for the patient, Dr. Both. And you cannot go grossly wrong in this. You can do no harm to the patient. And you really need no expensive equipment. Just a little extra effort is required. Even if you don't have anything, you can still go on with the toric IOL. And to tell you that these IOL actually work, if you see the residual refractive error, more than 60-70% of the patients will have less than 0.5. And below 180-90% of the patient in all these studies will have below one adapter of asymmetrism. Same is the misalignment. Misalignment usually is two to three degree or four degree, and beyond ten degree is only two to three percent of the patients will have beyond ten degree of misalignment, which will be significant. Another important my thought process is I'm not seen anywhere else because when the corneal asymptotes suppose from zero, yeah, 180, it is 42 diopter, and at 90 degrees is 40. It is not a straight line. It's not a point. There's a plateau then it starts dipping over here. And if this plateau is there, that means three to five degree of misalignment is really not going to cause much of the influence because the corneal asymptotes will have some area of five to 10 degree where it will remain at 42 diopter. So the small misalignment will not cause much of the difference. And once we are now trying to achieve the target of post-operative asymptotes of less than 0.5, due diligence 
has to be given to all the factors and factors affecting most of results to my mind measurement is the key you know measuring is wrong and the selecting the iul is another most important part and ultimately surgical skill plays a very minimal role up to the if i say the weightage if i got to give i'll give 70% weightage to the measurement 20% to the selection of the iul and 10% to the surgical skill so there are various instruments available and all of them and most of them should be used at least two to three instruments must be used to find out what is the actual corneal asphyxia in my practice what i do is i take a optical biometry and pentagram readings and to compare whether the data are correct or not the anterior corneal power of the pentacam is compared with the optical biometer and the anterior corneal power up to 3 mm zone because optical biometer measures in that area should be compared not the total corneal power not at 4 mm not at point uh, 1 mm so we need to compare and then look at the crowding of values not average so whenever you got a toric i will ask him to bring the toricity of the five readings all which has been taken and then see if there is any outlier discard them if there is no crowding then either we are dealing with the irregular cornea or we are dealing with the dry eye otherwise the reading should be closer to each other they should not be very far off so intra or inter equipment if there is a difference of axis more than 10 degree and power more than 0.5 diopter we must treat the dry eye most of the time wherever i have gone wrong and because initial the assumptions were entirely different when the patient was operated he was on a stride and lubricant his corneal assumptions were entirely different so use in fact it will not be out of the place the patient has got a time and patient is not very far off from your place to treat the patient with the mild response of lubricant for one to three weeks before you decide about the uh, keratometric values so if the segment persists what to do so acceptance of the spectacles can give you the idea which way to go if there is too much of a disagreement between the two i trust pentacam total corneal power and access more than the optical biometer for my calculation and for my uses but if refractive cylinder is matching with the optical biometry i will trust the optical biometer for example if the optical biometer axis is 17 pentacam axis is 30 but i had another patient of these values and his spectacles is using at 10 degree his acceptance is at 10 degree was a post lasic patient so i implanted the iul at 15 degree so in spite of the fact that i trust pentacam more but if there is agreement between the two instrument we should trust that more that means it may be auto k or manual keratometer or whatever may be the system and again when we are selecting the axis and power if the optical biometer is giving 10 and pentacam is giving 20 i trust pentacam more but i will err on the side of the optical biometer that means i will mark the axis 20 i'll mark another at 15 so that anything between 20 to 15 i should definitely not go beyond 20 even if it is 12 15 17 so there is always little bit of a doubt whether you are perfectly matched or not so err on the side of the that side so as the power selection is concerned aim is to have complete correction at now or what not after 5 years what happens to the patient it turns to the against rule or not but i want but the problem is the toricity of level at the iul is in the steps of 0.75 which translates into 0.5 in the corneal plane we know that the corneal toricity is usually between the two available powers so what we need to do is then these are the power influence when i want to decide which power to use aging with the rule against the rule posterior corneal power sia and incision site and th chamber depth and spectacles these are the modifiers these per se do not influence as much i use them as an influencer to decide which site to err on so distance visual acuity is dependent on a volume more than axis but minus cylinder 90 degree gives better near vision that means the residual atr we are trying to overcorrect the atr for the future but at the same time we need to understand the residual against rule acceptance gives a good for near vision and that is probably the way of nature that it increases the a sensitivity of the eye as you become old it shifts to the against rule acceptance so that you can see when the specs were not there the people can still see for the near so this is the another point to be kept in mind 
So the influential when we talk of if the corneal asymmetric correction needed is 1.75, then IOL available A is 1.5, B is two diapters. So what to choose? So we take into the posterior corneal curvature. It increases ATR but decreases VTR, WTR. But it is only two in 85 percent of the cases. So that means if you are dealing with the rule asymmetries, 1.5 will be better. But if you are dealing with against rule asymmetries, then two will be better. So go for the two instead of 1.5. But if it is total corneal power by pentacam, then this is not true because the posterior corneal curvature has been already taken into the account. Again, aging. As you know that the younger patient keep on shifting towards the ATR. So you can go for two diapter and older patient, you can go for 1.5 diapter. Again, surgically induced asymptomatic and incision. Most of the time, 2.2 millimeter incision in my hand is not more than 0 0.1, 0 0.2. So really I do not plan for that. But if it is an steep axis incision you are going to give the and it is uh, the uh, against the rule asymptomatic, 1.5 is good enough because 0 0.2, 0 0.3 you can correct with your incision by making the incision 2.75 instead of minor, uh, just 2.2. And if it is on a flat axis, then go for the two adapter. Same way anterior chamber depth. So the, the toricity effect as the ACIUL we put up a low power and the PCIUL is up a high power for the same patient. Same way when the lens is closer to the cornea, it has got more effectivity than when it is away from the cornea. That means if the patient is having deep myope with say power of 12, 15, probably he needs more toricity correction. I'll go with the plus uh, two adapter toricity correction. If it's a high probe, and the anterior chamber depth is 2, 2.2, I'll go with 1.5. And again, a spectacle power, I always see the patient's spectacle power because one, it gives me a very good idea to explain to the patient that you have been using cervical power. And if luckily the cervical power is higher than your cardiac estimate, it gives you the lot of cushion. And spectacle power, if it is minus 2 in this patient, while the corneal estimate is 1.75, I'll go with the higher power. So B lens. So that means these all will influence which way to move, which way to err on. But otherwise, if I get dot on, I'll go with the dot on without bothering about all of them. There are various methods of marking, but there are studies to prove that there's not much of a difference between one method to another. And as simple as this marking works as well as any other method of marking. I mean, there may be a little bit of a difference. But what is important is this is our old video, very old video where we used to mark at uh, sitting the patient and patient like a confrontation test looks straight ahead and then mark it over there. But the important thing is to remember is that you are marking a reference point. You are not marking a six o'clock position. After putting this mark, this mark itself is five to ten degree thick. You need to analyze where exactly the six o'clock is. That means whether it's in the center of the mark, on the left side of the mark, or the right side of the mark, a little away from the, because when you are putting your hands, it may not go exactly at six o'clock. So it is the analysis, whatever, whether it's a 90 or 180 degree, wherever you're marking, you are putting a reference point and then analyze where actually you feel the 90 and 180 degrees. Do not presume that dot itself is 90 or 180 degrees. And once you are putting an implant, use Helon GB or do the hydro implantation. And as surgery, do not use the methyl cellulose because methyl cellulose cannot be removed completely from the capsular bag. So if you use the Helon GV, it comes out completely. If you use the methyl cellulose, it remains there and the post-op rotation chances will be higher. This I have found out when I was using the star toric eyewell, which I imported long time back when the, when the Alcon were not manufacturing the toric eyewells. And I found the significant rotation, rotation was in the patient who used the, where we use the methyl cellulose. So I stopped using methyl cellulose. Either I do the hydro implantation or I use the sodium hyaluronate. So in this case, what I wanted to show the another important point was that before you withdraw, this is infusion cannula is inside the eye. So before you withdraw, you must put an air to press it from the top. So before you withdraw, so that the lens does not pop up and the chamber does not collapse. So to summarize in the basics, 
the dry eye management is the key. So far as I'm concerned, whenever there is a surprise, most of the time it is the dry eye because the patient comes and immediately we want to book the patient if we can go for that. I trust pentakayam is more reliable than optical biometer and that reflection in that order. But we need to see which of the two equipments are matching with each other or even the manual keratometer may be excellent. What I call the, uh, there should be at least agreement between the two observers or you do the two times examination or two equipments, then probably your measurement is accurate. Access is more important than power. I mean, if there's a power of 1.5, now there's 2.5, you can correct two, but it's still a 1.75, still you will be happy. But access, if it is more than 10 degree variation, it creates a lot of confusion. So these all are other things of power influencer per se, I do not give them that much of a better, but when I'm deciding which lens to use, I see all those points before deciding. And marking is always, you're marking a reference point. You are not marking exactly 90 or 180 degree. And put on another mark, you want to put which side to err upon. If suppose you are dark, most of the time you may have a confusion three, four, five degree, whether I'm right or wrong, which side the error will be more far given. Do not use methyl cellulose while putting an implant and do put air on top of it. Do not keep the IOP where high when you close the incision because if the IOP is very high, the bag may be inflated and the lens may rotate. But if the capsular bag is flat, and the entire capsule is pressing against the posterior capsule, it is not very uh, tight, then the chances of post-op rotations are minimal. Uh, should I go ahead with the second presentation now? Uh, Hello? Yes, sir. yes, sir. I think you can go ahead. Okay. I will take up the questions uh, uh, at the end of all the talks. Yeah. So now I come to the toric IOLs in irregular cornea. So whether to put on a toric IOL or not is depends upon the stability of the astigmatism. A patient is using spectacles, cylindrical power, and his vision improves with cylindrical correction on the spectacles, then his vision will improve with the cylindrical correction in the toric IOL as well. But we need to tell him that his improvement will be as with the spectacles, not completely. So in irregular cornea, if any patient is using contact lens, particularly RGB, then the toric IOL contraindicated because if it is comfortable, the toric IOL will never give that quality of vision what the RGB as clear contact lenses will give. So I had to expand some of the keratoconus patient, which was put the toric IOL. So the progressive and recurrent corneal pathology like PUK, Morens, Majapalasa, RP simplex, recurrent immunological and peptidal disease is a contraindication for these because the toricity will keep on changing. I'll take up the RK as the, uh, the prototype for this post RK toric IOL. And those who have not seen the RK surgery, so what we used to do is we used to give a radial cut leaving the central three millimeter. So because of the IOP, this radial cut, you will cause the paracentral steepening. This will bulge out and that will pull this down. So there was a paracentral steepening because of the weakening and flattening of the center. And this goes on forever in the patient's life. This is what we call as a hypopic shift. Initially, patient may be hematropic, then he keeps on becoming hypopic forever. And they usually diagonal fluctuation in these patients. These patients also have in the morning, they may be hyperopic because of the corneal edema, and by evening they may, may become myopic. So there is the diagonal variation as well in these patients. So I'll just uh, instead of going on to the theory, I'll just show my two, three cases what happened to them. So this was a 51 year old male with a prior of RK and his subjective reflection was minus four with minus 3.5 at 120 degree and vision was 612. And optical biometry, if you see that the average or the mean of the two was 37.49 and cylinder is very good agreement 3.78 at 75 and the power which was given by Barrett formula was 13.5. And on the pentacam, Actually, keratometry was 39.4 and the cylindrical was more or less in agreement and axis was also in agreement. So if you see that the target reflection, if we keep zero, then optical biometer was more accurate than the pentacam because the ocular biometer is flatter as compared to the pentacam. So we need to take a flattest reading 
so which was very good in this case and we always calculate on iol calc scs dot r and then the another point was whether to use the toric or no toric so in this case there is absolutely no confusion because there is very good agreement on the toricity as well as the axis of the patient so another is what iol power you use so i always target refraction minus 1 in all my these patients so this comes to around 15 diopter with the toricity corrected by this so this was very simple absolutely no confusion and the patient was a myopic and the iol power was on the myopic side is perfectly all right this is the another patient we which had 56 year old patient and in this you can see that the asymmetry is 6.25 at 172 the total corneal power is 36.6 and the the power which was given by the srgt a barrett was 21 diopter but once we do the pentacam the so pentacam has the corneal uh, total corneal value 32.5 estimate is 6.2 volume is the same but axis is different from 172 to 149 and once we do the calculation if we do the target zero then the power which was coming minimum was 23.60 which was closer to the biometric values 21 22 but the maximum was 27.64 which is because of the pentacam which is 36.61 and this is there is a difference of the keratometric value of four diopter between the biometer and a pentacam so the, we need uh, to have the flattest k and the pentacam is giving us a flattest k and when we target minus 1 then the values were 29 So this is the important. So instead of now, I would have gone with this twenty-one, twenty-two would have been grossly wrong. We went with the twenty-nine, and now the second point comes: what axis should we correct the toric or not? So in this case, when there is too much of a disagreement, we did the auto ref reading, and you can see this is coming eight diopter of central power at one sixty-four, one sixty-five degree. And while the biometer axis is 172, 149 pentacam, so we went 165 with axon result. So in such an irregular asymmetry, the refractive asymmetry is extremely, extremely, extremely important. This is another case, 52 years, 32 incision, unaided vision, county finger, and if you see over here, what we are getting, the total IOL power was 10.5. This was I didn't uh, realize at that time, and the Uh, total corneal power was forty one point six four, and this is the type of asymmetry this patient had. So the we went to iolcalcases dot com. Average was nine point seven nine, minimum was seven point seven, maximum was eleven point five. We went for the twelve point five, and to our surprise, one week post op, patient had seven diopter with uh, a plus five diopter cylinder. Three weeks, this was like this. Uh, AR was thirteen point five or one point five diopters in care, one forty five degree, and the acceptance of the patient was nine diopters spherical with the four point five diopter at one forty degree and vision was six nine part. So there was a total surprise. What next? We went for the IOL action. One month post surgery, they said to go for IOL action, and uh, I presume that twenty seven should be all right. I'll place the twenty seven, and at the end of the surgery, the patient had now we we didn't put the toric IOL. It was three p cycle which was placed, and with the minus two with the plus five cylinder at one forty five degrees six twelve part. If you see the spherical equivalent was still on the plus side, which I was not very happy. So the over over scleral contact is patient at this position. So very simply, when you see the optical biometry, one diopter of the iol power changes nearly point six seven diopter of the refraction. So whenever you see the 0.5, 0.5 step, it keeps on changing by 0.32, 0.32, 0.33. 0 so if we presume that that is accurate, then IOL exchange calculation based on over refraction. If I go for that, so a spherical equivalent of plus nine plus 4.5 is 11.25, and if we make 1 point multiplied by 1.5, it is 16.87, and IOL which was put initially was 12.5. We add 16.87 to this, makes it 29.37, which would have been more accurate than using 27. What I want to highlight that over refraction is very very crucial whenever you are going for a IOL action than anything else. So refraction in irregular cornea, either post-op or pre-op, is the key whenever you are dealing with the irregular cornea.
So there is another patient whose IUL power was coming in two and uh, plus two and minus six. So we planned for secondary IUL. Post of refection was plus thirteen, and secondary IUL was implanted with consistent adapter. So uh, the important issue is that whenever you are not so sure, secondary IUL is always an option. And probably whenever the power is coming like this, probably you are taking the keratometry of the ectatic area. So we need to have the flattest keratometric value. We need to calculate an IUL cal ASCS dot R. Target refraction should be between minus 0.5 to minus 2. Usually I keep it around minus 1. Any keratometric value above 40 is suspicious. It may be paracentral because most of the time, uh, normal cornea is 43. Whenever you are giving an RK incision, it is going to go down. Any biometric, biometric value below 18, you have to cross check because uh, if the hypropic, until this patient is already having a myopic reflection, then it's fine. If he's having a hypropic reflection, the patient should definitely have more than 21. And in my experience and whatever I had done the hypothetical analysis of the patient, if it was minus C created by RK, minus 5 created by RK. So I come to the conclusion that most of these patients need a power of 24 to 28. If it is coming less than that, be careful. Astigmatic correction by refraction and cylindrical power is equally important. Post of refraction for IOL exchange is extremely important. IOL exchange and secondary IOL is always an option. So now I come to the toric IOL surprise. Calculation and correction of the misalignment. What is a toric IOL surprise? Presence of the cylindrical refractive error of more than 0.5 diopter post toric IOL implantation for the cataract surgery may be called as a toric IOL surprise. My, I have got a very simple logic. Does pre-operative keratometric power and access matters? No. Do we need any app like accessibilitysfix.com? No. Do we need to take any photograph or set lamp with any app to find out the access of the IOL? No. We don't need it. Why? Because we know that the toric I will work best in a steep corneal access. That's it. So whatever it was before surgery makes no difference. What it is now, that is what is important. So we can't hear you. Yeah, yeah, just me. So what you need is you need to find out whether rotating or realigning the lens will decrease the asymptotes. So we need to put it and whether we should rotate it or not, that is very important. Whether rotation is advisable and possible or not, that is important. So I'll tell you, whenever there is a toric I will surprise, there are two components. One is non-correctable by toric I will realignment. And second is correctable by the toric IOL realignment. So first we need to find out what cannot be corrected by even the best of the alignment. And then to calculate how much is the misalignment. So that means if there's a keratometric astigmatism and the lens, it can correct at the corneal plane. Suppose the patient had a keratometric astigmatism of three adapter and the lens can correct only 1.5 adapter, use the lens which can correct at cornea 1.5 so that means whatever you do, there is 1.5 you cannot correct. So wherever you put this lens, because the cornea asymptotism is 3 and the lens can correct only 1.5. On the other hand, if the corneal asymptotism is 2 and the lens can correct 1.5, that means 0.5 cannot be corrected. And if the corneal asymptotism is 1.5 and the lens can correct 1.5, that means the full correction is possible if the lens is well aligned. If the corneal is 0.75 and lens is 1.5, that means 0.75 cannot be corrected. So first, we need to find out with the existing, after the surgery, what is the keratometric value and what corneal plane this lens can correct. And detect that, you will find that this is a non-correctable value. This cannot be corrected, whatever you might, wherever you might put the IOL. So now once you have got non-correctable component, now, with the refraction of the patient, we can find out what is the correctable component in this refractive surprise. So, there's a total refractive cylindrical power. Whatever patient is getting the cylindrical power on his specs, and if you reduce the non-correctable component from that, 
the rest of it is correctable by the realignment so in the same example if you see that non correctable component was 1.5 in the first patient and post of refractive error was 1.5 that means there is no correctable error patient has to live with it because it was supposed to correct 1.5 it has corrected 1.5 so there is no nothing realignment will not work in the second case the non correctable was 0.55 and post of refractive was 1.5 that means one diopter of error is because of misalignment which you can recover and patient the lens can be rotated in the third case where there was absolutely 100% correction was possible you got 1.5 that means the lens was totally out of place 30 degree misaligned and it can be completely corrected and i mean in the third case also it can be corrected so once you find out what can be corrected then we need to reverse calculate the amount of the misalignment if we correct misalignment we do not correct the refractive error the refractive error is the by product of correcting the misalignment so misalignment calculation of axis is important to find out whether we should actually go in or not i will just highlight just now if you see that the, if there is a residual correctable asthmatic means of one diopter and total correction possible was one diopter that means the lens is off by 30 degree that means residual or correctable axis divided by the total correction possible and multiplied by 30 because if we know that if the lens misaligns by 30 degree there is no correction of the asthmatic so with that if the patient had the one diopter of correctable axis and total was supposed to be corrected by one that means there was no correction one by one multiplied by 30 that means the misalignment is by 30 degree but on the other hand if there is a high power lens total correctable was six diopter and the residual is only one so that means one by six multiplied by 30 that means misalignment five diopter of correction has been already achieved so misalignment is only 5 degree so miss though the refractive error the refractive surprise is the same but in the second case misalignment is only 5 degree that means if we see into this chart if there is a one diopter of residual correctable asymmetries so il power at a corner plane if it was 1 there is a 30 degree of misalignment if it was 2 it is a 15 degree of misalignment if it is 3 it is a 10 degree of misalignment all these three patients can be taken up for the realignment because there is significant misalignment but if you see if it was supposed to correct 4 and 6 then misalignment is only 7.5 and 5 degree which will be very very difficult to realign that means a patient need a 6 diopter of correction you got 5 1 diopter is residual you got to go with it that is better than try to correct 5 diopter misalignment so we need to realignment is done when there is a significant misalignment and it can correct significant residual asymmetry that means in a whenever you are using a lower power toric iol for the same amount of asymmetry the misalignment much more and you can easily correct it but whenever you are using a high power toric iol and even if there is a one diopter left probably you cannot correct it by the realignment so i'll just give you one example this was a patient 67 years male the lens star reading was 1.39 at 92 pentacam was 1.5 at 93 and we operated the multifocal toric iol 16 1.5 and this is the picture so uncorrected distance visual acuity was 618 best corrected with the one diopter spherical 1.5 diopter cylindrical at 30 degree was 66 so now we went back and did the lenses star reading which was 1.56 at 94 pentagram at 3 mm was 1.6 at 95 patient was completely younger and at 4 mm normally i take between 2 and 3 4 mm it was 1.1 at 81.4 so we planned for you can see the difference in the axis between at 3 mm and 4 mm here the lenses are helps you at 94 so we went and planned to put it at 90 degree and correction achieved by this lens was more or less zero because there was no correction the lens was totally misaligned so i don't have to take any photograph i don't have to do anything just put the lens into shift axis because there is enough of misalignment which can be corrected so there is no need to do anything so the patient was taken into the operation theater and very simple you open up the side port incision you don't have to open the main port incision we mark the 90 degree axis 
and when i marked this i realized that this my mark was slightly on the temporal side so i'm marking 90 degree slightly on the nasal side of this mark you can see that so this is what i call as a reference point and i take a sharp chopper to make three indentations over there this uh, do i for the toric aisle and then you can put on ink on top of that and because the advantage of three points is that usually the peripheral most mark is more accurate because you are uh, there is less parallax over there and uh, even uh, when you are putting these marks you can mentally analyze which of these marks are more at 90 degree so this was the original side port incision i usually make only one side port incision but for uh, repositioning because i need a infusion from one side and repositioning from the other side so i created another side port incision and then this lens is uh, very easy to rotate for sodium alnate and this is just two three weeks old so not very difficult so just redial it make sure it goes into the 90 degree and again before you withdraw your infusion put an air bubble from top of it and press this lens back so remove the visco elastic from behind the lens which is very very essential and this is where the sodium halonate or uh, halon or uh, orogel or uh, janet plus score over the methyl cellulose so remove the complete visco elastic and see the final position of the lens now once the lens is finally positioned put on a air before drying the infusion so that the lens is pressed back and make sure that the incisions are well sealed before you leave the patient so the post alignment patient had plus 0.25 diopter spherical power 66 and even pre operatively he had the spherical equivalent of plus 0.25 thank you very much for giving me the opportunity and listening to it thank you very much uh, thank you uh, arvind sir for uh, doing a wonderful job you know you have covered uh, so much in uh, a short uh, span of time and then there are so many uh, vistas that have opened up for the discussion uh, the, some of the concepts i think which needs to be more elaborated uh, we will take it up uh, ramesh after your talk and after chandrashekar's talk because because i myself wanted to ask you a few questions about you know the for the last two topics <laughs> but let i mean if they are already covered by that uh, by ramesh's talk and chandrashekar's talk then maybe we can economize on some time and take up other points So Ramesh, sure, Arup. yes, sir. Thanks, sir. Arup, that that was a fantastic talk by sir, and it was just mind blowing. Thank you Absolutely. so much. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. I think you could have spoken for half an hour on each segment. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, actually, it was like that only. I. I mean, I had given you the full uh, this thing, sir. It is your field, field, open field for you. Can you see my my screen? Yes, yes, yes. We can. Okay. So thank you so so much, Arup, for inviting me to talk on the seven tips for toric and trochlear lenses. Just give me a moment. I would like to make this a little more comfortable. Okay. so i am ramesh dorirajan from sundar eye clinic in chennai so the first tip is to get an accurate k and uh, we should take the keratometry before applying any drops on the cornea in my hospital we do not charge for optical biometry and the optometrist will take the measurements in patients with cataracts before dilating them if they miss this step the patient is called back for k on a different day so a pristine k on a virgin cornea is most important Uh, just give me a moment i have two presentations and this is one of my uh, prelim ones which has come up i will yes here we are so the the second tip is please when you take a print out from your biometric meter take out the toric print out don't take out the standard spherical equivalent print out 
In addition, train your staff to check Barrett's online calculator so that if a patient asks you, doctor, which lens will you advise for my eye? It will be very easy to see. For example, in this particular patient, we know the spherical equivalent is going to be 23.5, but there's also a, a plus one cylinder and a T2 will help this patient to some extent. So you can probably tell them that you'll have a little bit more clarity if you choose the toric lens package. The third tip is don't use company calculators. Always use the Barrett's online calculator. There will always be a small difference, whether it's J&J, Alcon, or any, any, any of the companies. For example, in this, the company calculator for this patient says axis of placement is 17 degrees, while Barrett's online will give you a 13. And, and this company says that you have to put a 2.25 cylinder in this patient, while here the Barrett online uh, suggests that you put a three of the uh, a three, a three cylinder toric lens. So by and large, my results with the Barrett's have been extraordinarily good. So I don't go with the company calculators. I use only the Barrett's online calculator. This was beautifully explained by Dr. Harbans that you so often will get uh, uh, these two options. One will slightly give you an against the rule and one will slightly give you a with the rule. I totally agree with this concepts that especially with the younger person where it's likely to get more eight year cylinder as they age, it's better to go for a little higher power. And for the elderly people, you can probably choose uh, uh, a slightly uh, eight year cylinder. Although slightly more against the rule, residual astigmatism will give the patient better near vision. If you are planning to do a multifocal lens or if you're planning to do a monovision for these patients, getting as close to plano excellent disinvision is most important. And so we, we should try to minimize the residual, residual cylinder as much as possible. Barrett's online calculator will take care of variations which happen because of the anterior chamber depth as well as a, as a, as a axial lens. So it does the internal calculation for myopes and the hyperopes. So probably we don't have to take that into consideration if you're using the Barrett's online calculator. But it's very important that you take into consideration the patient's uh, pre-existing, whether it's with the rule or against the rule, and how old the patient is. Tip three is how to determine the axis in unusual eyes. So you take your topography for irregular cornea when you have a normal corneal thickness. Like in this particular patient who's got a corneal scar, there is no loss of, of corneal volume and the corneal thickness is normal. And anterior K, which, will, which you can get from topography, is enough. How exactly do you get the topographic K? This was, this was de described as a credit card method. You see the topographic map, and then you put your visiting card or your credit card so that it bisects the red as evenly as possible into two halves. And, and that will lead you on to the, to the axis which this particular patient needs. On the other hand, when the corneal surface is altered due to refractive surgery, or if it's thin due to ectasia, the normal Gulston ratio is altered. In these patients, the posterior corneal measurement becomes much more important, and you must use an instrument which will give you a true K. A true K is, is a K reading where, it, where the calculation is taken based on it, both the front as well as the back surface. All the tomographers will do this for you. Most of the, of the, of the uh, OCT-based Biometers also will give you a true K. And you must use the Barrett's true K formula as opposed to Barrett's regular toric where the, where the anterior surface is taken into account. Now, these are the surgical tips for the first five, five patients, especially for the beginners. Please consider doing only ATR cylinders. These are more easy to do. And you will end up keeping the lens in the horizontal plane, not in the vertical plane. Your chances of rotation are much less in the horizontal plane. The lens will be more stable. And the calculation also is more easy. Please choose patients who need a higher correction for the initial patients. Don't, don't take patients who need a one, one uh, cylinder or a, or a, or a 1.25 or a 0.75 kind of correction. Though I have no financial interest, I find that Alcon toric lenses are the most stable of the several that I have tried. And so for your first five patients, make it easy on yourself. Please try an Alcon toric lens. And this is the uh, one more uh, uh, tip. Use an SAA of zero. Understanding SAA is a key for improving your toric outcomes. 
and we should realize that less than 2.8 or even 3 millimeter temporal corneal phaco incisions induce negligible astigmatism and they do not flatten the incision axis by 0.5 diopter. So we are not talking about the mean, mean cylinder, we are talking about a centroid value. After seeing nearly 37,000 data from 37,000 eyes from various surgeons in different parts of the world, Warren Hill says that that the average centroid value of the various surgeons seems to be around 0.12. So don't put 0.5 or 0.3 as your, as your SIA. Choose a, point, a 0 0.12 or you can even aim for a zero. So what are the factors that affect the surgically induced astigmatism? Location is very important. If you choose a temporal location, you will have the least amount of SIA. Superior and, and oblique locations will give you differing amounts of SIA. Incision architecture, a single plane, plane incision will give you the least. And if you have a small cornea, if you have a thin cornea, and you are operating on a young patient, very young patient where the cornea is less, is less rigid, the SIA is likely to be higher. If you stuff the foldable lens through a very tight incision, you will cause incision stretching and tear of the margins and this is likely to increase your SAA. So these are the, some of the factors that, that, that affect the SAA in any, any particular patient. Now, in all toric calculators, the mean value is not used, but the centroid value is used. Let us see how the centroid value is calculated. And this is from a series of 147 eyes. The next five slides are from Dr. Warren Hill's presentation. I thank him for giving me permission to use his slides several years ago. So these 147 eyes were uh, had surgery by the same expert surgeon. Femto laser aspect cataract surgery was done, and this is the sequential SAA of those eyes. And and look at this interesting thing. See all the orange boxes: 0 0.13, 0 0.10, 0 0.04. Many eyes have negligible amount of SAA. But if you look at the pink, if you look at the pink, 1.02, 1.42. So and look, look at this particular data. This patient has an SA of 0 0.10. The very next patient by the same surgeon, same temporal, temporal flax incision, 1.42. So what this tells us is in an individual patient, we have no idea what the SA is going to be. SA can vary a lot from patient to patient. So although we do a nice surgery, we have made an incision, we have, we have aligned the intraocular lens, and we feel we are perfect, it is not logical for, and I, yeah, if I imagine that I have flattened this particular incision by 0.5 diopter, if I imagine that, it is not true. This patient may have a very minimal uh, astigmatism on some other SA on some other axis, or he can have a much larger SA on a totally different axis. I don't know uh, what this particular patient's SA will be. So in this series of 147 patients who had femto cataract done, the centroid value, the centroid value represents the, the most accurate value. And in this particular series, it comes to 0 0.08. So although you have different amounts of SAA, they are not all in the same axis. You see this point, 0.75 SAA at 45 degrees. And down here, 0.75, this represents 0.75 cylinder at 120 degrees. Here at 150 degrees, because they are at different, different axes, they tend to cancel each other. And your final centroid value is a very small number, close to 0.1 in this particular series. So mean value is not important. Centroid value is how the calculators work. And, and, and in, in, uh, in, over, uh, in, in a nearly 32,000 cases, Dr. Warren Hill says, the average centroid value for the average Baco surgeon is around 0.12. Now, as Dr. Husband has said, if your intraocular lens is a few degrees off target, if he showed a beautiful curve, there is a remarkably, in, uh, remarkably interesting fact which never struck me till now. I learned so much from his, uh, from the previous uh, uh, wonderful talk. But if your eye oil is off by a few degrees, the effective correction will decrease. We know this. It's interesting that the effect of the toric lens will reduce if the rotation is clockwise or anticlockwise. So it's impossible to overcorrect with the toric lens and possible to undercorrect. 
So I always aim for a little bit of overcorrection, and I keep my SAA not at zero point one, but at but at zero. So I I am I am betting that my lenses will be slightly off, and I am compensating for that. Now here are a few surgical tips. Please learn to use the same temporal peripheral corneal incision. Cutting on the steep axis will not give you consistent result. Consider doing a posterior capsulorexis and posterior optic capture. If you have a very very large bag and the lens is loose, if you are putting a plate haptic lens in the eye, especially in hyperopic eyes, and you try to rotate a plate haptic lens, it's possible to tear the zonules because these lenses can get locked in. So if you are using a plate haptic toric lens, please rotate it outside the bag to the final axis and tap it down into the bag. I do a single step slit lamp, twenty twenty. Uh, six uh, no 21 gauge disposable needle marking so we uh, just before the operation theater i have a slit lamp and this has a slit bag we, we can turn the axis to the final axis the patient is seated paracin is applied and we chat with him mostly he doesn't know what's happening we do uh, we do one or two parallel marks on the cornea that's it so i don't do two step marking a reference and a final mark i do a single needle mark and this has helped me well for the last 10 years And it's easy to get results like this: P2 lens, 6-6 partial post-op, etc., etc. Tip number six: Please be prepared to rotate or exchange the lens if needed. You can see this particular lens. Uh, this particular patient who had, uh, he was an uh, in his mid 80s with, uh, uh, and he developed zonular dialysis during phaco emulsification. So I'm putting a Sioni lens in, a uh, uh, Sioni, uh, a CTR inside, and I'm I'm anchoring the CTR with a. Uh, With the Hoffman suture, and then I'm place, placing the lens in the eye. So when you're doing toric lenses, please be prepared for additional steps because every patient may not have a nice, nice young patient with a with a with a very clear back. When you want to rotate or exchange the lens, I don't have the brilliant mind of my previous speaker. I take the easy way out. So I use the Barrett's RX calculator or the Berthel and Hart and toric eyeball calculator. I've used this only once, and my results have been good. And they do all the back end calculation and just give me the final step to which I I had to place the lens. So this particular patient had a uh, I had to place a suture because he had a small wound tear. And two months later, he was unhappy with a 1.2 1.25 re residual cylinder. So I had to rotate this lens by 167 degrees as per the Berthel and Harden online calculator, and. Uh, Uh, I, I, I'm using a um, uh, visco to uh, to separate the anterior and posterior leaflet. When you separate them, please start at the optic haptic junction where the uh, addition is weakest. And when you inject visco, you can actually see the wave coming forward. This was done about two and a half months after surgery, so it had fused quite a bit. So be prepared to rotate the lens or exchange the lens once in a while. Tip number seven: Undersell and enjoy the wow effect. I tell my patients that they will see five to ten percent better with the toric lens. There is very little pressure on them to choose this if they have financial constraint. And I, I tell them they will be having the same clarity if, if, with with a minor glass power, and if they choose a less expensive option. So it's up to the patient to choose a toric lens, undersell it, and some many of them will come back and tell you, doctor, I never seen so clearly in my life. Even when I was young, especially if you if you correct a three-cylinder or a three-point-five-cylinder patient, they'll come and tell you they've never seen so clearly in their life, even when they were young. So this is my last tip for the day. Arup, over to you. Uh, <clears throat> thanks a lot, Ramesh, uh, for a brilliant presentation as usual. And uh, before Nirupama gets ready with her uh, questions, uh, I'll ask Chandrasekhar. to present his uh, pearls his uh, accurate over a period of so many decades over to chandra uh, uh can you hear me yes we can hear you you can see your slides make it full screen yeah uh, so uh, it was a excellent presentation by dr uh, um, harbans lal sir and also by dr ramesh there are so many new things which have come up and i'm sure will there will be a good discussion um i have got my seven tips but wherever there is a repetition i'll try to skip that slide or go fast on that 
So tip number one is first we should start with topography and tomography. Previously we used to see only the anterior, uh, you know, axial curvature or sagittal curvature, but now everything is important because these are the things which will tell us whether there is anything wrong with the cornea, whether the Gulstrand ratio is altered, whether the patient is post refractive surgery or post C3R, uh, pachymetry is high. It will tell us whether there is a Fuchs dystrophy, which can of course play havoc while doing a uh, tori uh, But if you come to the three important points about topography, we have to see the regularity of the uh, of the map. Okay. Second is the power, and third is the axis. Power has to be cho chosen from the non-topography keratometers, and axis has to be cho uh, chosen from the topography. So. I will come to this later on, but according to holiday, we have to take the five millimeter circle for choosing the axis. Uh, tip number two. Now, the, these are the conditions which can create havoc while doing <clears throat> toric oil calculations. They can be spoil sports. One is dry eyes, already explained by Dr. Lal sir. Then uh, epithelial uh, basement membrane uh, dystrophy, sazman nodular degeneration, Fuchs dystrophy, and pterygium. And this need to be addressed, or you may have to totally skip doing Tori Kayo. Uh, then tip number three is uh, paying attention to the details. Uh, many times we take the care readings from the machine, but do not look at the readings. Now, if you see over here in this particular patient, uh, I hope you can see the cursor. There are two dots which are missing in many of these uh, images. Now this patient had a cylinder of 1.25 diopters, uh, but he had a lot of dryness and the dryness was not evident, very greatly evident except for these two drops. And he was treated for dryness for about 15 days. And after that, when we saw those two dots reappeared and the cylinder reduced from 1.25 to 0.25. So we just don't take values. We have to concentrate. We have to look at the map or the images uh, of the LEDs properly. Uh, then the next tip is analysis of the cylinder. So uh, as Dr. Lal has already shown that many times we get different, different kinds of reading. So what practice I follow is that I take readings from three machines. And one of them is of course a topographer or tomographer like a Pentacam or a MS39 plus uh, IOL master or Lenstar and plus any machine like Varion or any dedicated uh, keratometer. Now, uh, we divide the patients into three categories. Uh, grade one is when, I'll just uh, minimize this. Yeah, grade one is when, uh, grade zero is that uh, there is no match at all. That means the difference in the power of the cylinder is 0.25. Mind you, we are not comparing the K readings, but we are comparing the cylinder. And the difference in the axis is more than 10 degrees. Over here, I'll go back to the manual keratometry. Now, why manual keratometry? That is the only static keratometry which is not largely uh, dependent on the dry eye status. Okay, whereas if you have so much of variation, most likely the patient has abnormal cornea or dry eyes, and then best is to go to the old age old method of manual keratometry. Then comes grade one, when the, uh, the cylinder is more than 0.1, but less than 0.85. And the difference in the axis is less than uh, 10 degrees, but more than five degrees. Then we go to Barrett median K or Barrett's integrated K. Barrett has developed this excellent tool where you can feed in three uh, K readings from the three different machines. And it will tell us what K to use. It does not average out. That's why it is called as Barrett Median K or Integrated K. And it's a fantastic tool. It is available on all the website, including APSARS. And the third is all the readings and cylinders are matching very well. That means the cylinder power are within 0.1 and axis is within five degrees. And then you can use any of them because the variation is going to be very less. You, it is possible to get grade two readings provided the optos are trained or the technicians are trained properly how to take readings. And that is the, where the comes the position of the head, the, the there's a black, a black mark on the 
a vertical bar next to the patient's head, the position of the chin, rotation, fixation, everything. And if we go and taking the reading before the tear frame starts breaking up. So suppose a patient has got a T-bot of five seconds, we have to take a reading before five seconds. Uh, how do you do that? You go very close to, uh, you know, very close where you're about to get a reading, ask the patient to uh, blink and just move your, uh, you know, joystick forward or backward, whatever, so that you get a readings. But suppose the patient has got a T-bot of say 10 seconds, then of course you have got a lot of uh, time. So when we are talking about dry eyes, it is more important to understand what is the T-bot rather than Shermas. Of course, Shermas is also important. But from the reading point of view, it is very important to understand what is the T bud. Uh, then uh, we come to the next step that what are the possible errors in marking? Okay, now these are the different examples uh, where you can get marks. Okay, because the, the smudging of the ink or the movement of the conjunctiva or the movement of the patient or wrong alignment of sleep plan. So, what we do? We mark but we measure the axis of the mark. Suppose you mark the axis at 90 degrees, it may be at 87 or 92 and therefore you measure the mark. So you draw a narrow slit which is passing through the center of the cornea, the corneal apex and the point where the mark is crossing the limbus at its midpoint and that is the axis of the mark and you measure it. I'll go back to the previous slide. So like this, now if you see this lower diagram with the bigger circle, this is the axis. So the mark may look slightly tilted because the patient moved or whatever the patient was squeezing, squeezing his eyes, but the marks are done at exactly 90 degrees. So what we do is measure the axis of the mark. Okay. And I adjust things accordingly. So you know that your mark is at 87 and then while doing axis marking, uh, you use 87 as the reference mark rather than 90. Then we talk about the corneal ectasia. Uh, in keratoconus, we always talk of debulking the astigmatism and treat only when the central three millimeter of the cornea is regular. So here I have shown that patient has got a big astigmatism, lot of astigmatism, but it is regular. So very good case for toric, whereas this patient on the right hand side has got an eccentric cone. And then uh, you, whatever calculations you do, you are likely to go uh, for a surprise. And uh, going a little further, uh, corneal ectasia, whether it is keratoconus, post 3 3R or uh, post lasic ectasia, we calculate, we, you know, uh, grade them according to topography. But there is a new classification available, retix classification, which takes into account uh, Q value, best corrected visual acuity, uh, uh, cylinder amount, and high order vibrations, etc. And that works very well. And when the reti according to the retic classification, the patient has got grade one or maximum grade two cornea, uh, keratoconus or ectasia, that is the time um, toric IOL is going to work the best. And as you go ahead more and more uh, into the grades, the astigmatism is likely to, you know, the toric IOL is likely to give you more and more surprise. Then the next tip is measured versus estimated PCA. So there is a lot of talk going on about uh, the Barrett TK or the total keratometry. Why? Because mathematical calculations assume that uh, whenever you have a WTR anterior, patient will have ATR posterior in increasing amount as the WTR increases. Whereas when you have ATR anterior, the posterior cornea will have fixed amount of ATR and which is very small, say 0 0.25, 0 0.3. But what we have seen is that all the corneas do not follow this rule. And therefore came the method of actually measuring the uh, posterior corneal astigmatism. But, and it is said that Barrett TK also improves the result, but most of the surgeons all over the world agree that in virgin cornea, you should not go by Barrett TK, you should go by a mathematical model that is an estimated K. And that's why as of both the speakers have said previously, Barrett uh, Universal 2 Toric calculator works the best. 
on the contrary when you have atypical cornea and the um, anterior posterior ratio or the gulf span ratio is altered that is the time we use measured here it is shown that going by uh, barrett truke method if you go by instead you go by barrett pk method there is a improvement in results by around 12 to 14% so there is no confusion as of now whenever you have virgin cornea don't think out barrett tk just go by normal barrett universal to toric calculator thank you very much uh thanks a lot uh, chandrashekhar again it was really a wonderful talk and a lot of interesting points you have emphasized uh we will start the question and answer session and uh, many of this uh, many of the points uh, which will be taken up during this session uh when there's an overlap with the three talks that have been delivered uh, we will uh, elaborate upon those points maybe a little bit more so over to you nirupama yeah thank you sir thank you so much uh, dr harbanj for that uh, insightful presentation uh, now we know how much mathematics is involved and uh, that's why dr arup called you a thinking surgeon because uh, there is so much thinking and planning involved before we choose uh, the correct iol when we plan for a toric uh, implantation and thank you so much dr ramesh and dr chandrashekhar for those useful practical tips which would be very useful for all uh, beginner uh, surgeons uh, who are planning for toric iol so we'll take up some queries and the first one is uh, whether uh, optical biometry is a must uh, can we still use manual keratometer or auto keratometer values and ultrasound biometry with the online barrett toric iol calculator and still plan for a toric iol implantation especially for uh, beginners who do not have the optical biometry set up in their practice is it advisable okay i i'll just take this question uh, so it is optical biometer biometer is a good the device to have uh, to give you more precise and accurate results but it is not a must it is not mandatory if you are comfortable with your manual uh, keratometry as well as you know uh, immersion a scan ultrasonography uh, you can definitely use uh, this basic equipment and produce wonderful results Uh, can they be used with the uh, barrett uh, online toric calculator yes they, this uh, this can be used with the barrett online toric calculator pro provided you have done a uh, uh, you know immersion or a scan for your patients and in that situation the iol constant that is used for the lens is the one uh, that is for the ultrasonic a constant and not the you know uh, optical a constant so this 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 thing has to be kept in the mind otherwise uh, the results may not be what you had really desired so this is my point of view i would invite opinion from others arup i totally uh, agree with you arup as far as the as the uh, a constant is concerned we need we actually have three a constants one is with the contact method one is with the immersion method and one is with the optical biometry so all three will have different a constant so the a scan with the, with the contact will not be the same as the a scan with the, the non contact so you need to you need to immersion method you must reduce 200 microns 0.2 mm and then and then you can put it into the calculator there will be a 200 micron difference because the a scan is getting reflected at the uh, uh, at the anterior surface of the retina so not reduce you have to add with the immersion you add 200 microns and then you can use the uh, the same calculation as the optical biometry yeah and i think it is a good idea to have a topographer in you know, a basic topographer uh, that this this is to rule out the conditions which i think dr hadban had already mentioned and uh, chandrashekhar had already mentioned that situations which are contraindications for uh, uh, toric intercalation actually aru what i always say is the rule of two that means if you got a assistant and you do the manual keratometry and your assistant does and if both of you get the same axis and the magnitude you could be pretty sure that it is all right if you do not have, even have a assistant then if you do it one today and one next day and see whether there is agreement on the two and if your keratometric values are matching with the refractive uh, spectral correction of the patient then you could be quite sure about your keratometric values yeah I, so just I, I, one I, I, one if the confidence is say 50% if two of them are matching more others you could be 90% sure that you are correcting the right uh, toric iol and of course the finer 
like uh, lower gratometric values, uh, lower estimates, probably you will not be able to correct with these methods. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with you. So, so uh, in a dry eye workup is very important for all uh, the patients uh, who are candidates for torticials and the premium lenses. And another thing that I do is, you know, I always repeat these measurements, even if the first measurement is okay. I'm talking only about the toric lenses and the, uh, and the lifestyle intraocular lenses, the, the multifocal lenses. And I just repeat it a second time. And if there is a concordance, then I'm, and I'm doubly con uh, confident that you know, the results are going to be good. So the next question is about measuring the K values using multiple equipment. So you had mentioned that it's good to repeat it and see the similarity of the calculations, but is it good also to use multiple devices? And also can we combine like the K value from one device and the axial length from another device and incorporate it in the online calculators? Ramesh? I think this was answered by Dr. Chandrasekhar Bhavikar. He mentioned that you can take it from three different instruments and get the integrated K function, which is slightly better than just taking yeah, any, any one. And it's when, always, especially when there is a disparity, then we can take the... There will always be a small difference. No two instruments will give you the same value. And uh, we should not underestimate the value of the manual keratometer. With the manual keratometer, we can see how uh, good the corneal surface is. I mean, all the dry eye, all these issues, we, we don't have to read the spots. When you see the ring, we'll know whether whether the, the, the toric lens will suit the patient or not. So if you have to use any one instrument alone, I feel manual keratometer is the most important one. The only drawback is manual keratometer is uh, uh, dependent upon the operator. Yes. And most of the time, because uh, we do not do now... We have to do it, sir. For a toric lens, we have to do it. No, no, no. But what I'm telling you, I mean, it's fine if you do it, it's okay. But most of the centers, most of the eye surgeons are not doing it. And many of them may not be even having the availability of the manual keratometer. So if the manual keratometer is operator dependent. So that has to be very, very clear that who is operating it. Ramesh, which are the vendors are dealing with manual keratometers? Because I had one. And when I approached the company to you know have a look at it, they said, sir, we have withdrawn all our services and this product. So I'm not, I have stopped using it. But it, I agree with you that when I was using it, I was quite happy with its outcome. Any uh, vendor uh, that uh, is dealing with this? Aru, currently I have the Apasami manual keratometer, Aru, and... Uh, but they uh, don't service this device any longer, do they? Uh, they are very inexpensive, Aru. We can buy a new one from them. They don't sell. They do. Uh, Apasami company will sell you a... Uh, they, they will sell you a portion long type of manual keratometer. Okay, I mean, last time I contacted them, they said, no, no, sir, we are... Maybe in Kerala, they're uh, not doing it, you know, but I agree that, you know, that there's a lot of subjectivity involved and you know, the, the, the operator experience also comes into the picture. Can I add something? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, see, uh, uh, see, basically all instruments are operator dependent. Even if you take Linstar and IOL Master 700, if the head position of the patient is not good, then we are going to get an error. So I think we have to pay a lot of attention to how the reading is taken. And uh, coming to the manual care, Dr. Arup, uh, we also have the same problem. We have the Apasami um, manual keratometer, age old thing, and they don't service it. But what we have done is that we have, we calibrate it in the day on a day, a single day, and we found out how much error it is introducing. And we take care of that much error. And that way we are getting pretty good results. Yeah. Next. So, uh, we'll go to the next question, which is on the importance of posterior corneal astigmatism. How much does it affect the final outcome? And uh, the importance of actual measurement versus the assumed mathematical values that are predicted uh -huh. in the online. Can I answer this question? Yes. So, so I think uh, I do not agree with the assumed values because if you are correcting 85% of them, making better 50% of them, you are making worst. So secondly, the posterior corneal aspect, if you can measure, it's fantastic because you are more sure. But in three conditions, this is more or less mandatory. 
One is that whenever you are correcting low corneal astigmatism, suppose you are going to correct say 0.9, 0.8, 0.75, then uh, you must measure the posterior corneal astigmatism. When you are correcting very high corneal astigmatism, whenever there is an anterior high corneal astigmatism, there is a many a times there is a very high posterior corneal astigmatism also, which I have seen the variation of 4 diopter to 0.5 diopter, 1.5, 1.75 diopter posterior corneal astigmatism. And secondly, in our oblique axis, there is whenever the patient has got the anterior surface astigmatism in oblique axis, there are more chances of having high posterior corneal astigmatism. So whenever you are correcting very high power, very low power, and oblique axis, it uh, uh, it should be measured. That will be better. Otherwise, I do not adjust according to the posterior corneal as I already presented my presentation. Just when I got to choose between the two, whether to use the lower and the higher, I go according to the posterior corneal curvature. But I do not add or subtract. So if I got to use 1.5 or 1. Uh, the uh, two, I'll decide on the basis of that. But no specific adjustment. So I just want to add one point here. Uh, see, uh, with oblique astigmatism, I think Barrett's does not uh, Barrett's totally calculator does not give as good results as, as uh, it gives for with the rule and against the rule. Yes. Recently, there was a study. I, I think there has been a series of studies recently by Shamas and his team. You know where they in, they used the measured posterior corneal values using the Pentacam. Dr. Harban, you are mentioning about Pentacam. Yeah, yeah. This was this was actually in healthy eyes not very steep or very flat corneas, healthy eyes where uh, predicted corneal astigmatism versus measured corneal astigmatism measured with the pentacam. And they found out that the predicted corneal astigmatism was definitely clinically as well as statistically superior to the value to the values which you're getting with the pentacam measured. Uh, I got no doubts. I got no doubts. I've been doing that. And in fact, I do not use any calculator, neither the company given nor the Barrett, nothing. I just take the measurements and I mark myself what axis, what power. The points are already elaborated, keeping all those points in mind. So I never use any online calculator. I never use any company calculator. I just calculate it myself. That's it. This is the axis I want. And this is the side I should err on if there's any error. And this is the power I want. And I, whenever there's a short supply, then I also mark the one, two, three. First choice is this, second choice is this, third choice is this. Uh, just to take this point forward, you know, for the young listeners here, you know, I mean, what Dr. Harbin had mentioned, say, for example, if when you talk about, say, the T7 lens, okay, todic lens. So now, how do I know the corresponding power roughly? So we subtract one from seven, seven minus one divided by two. So it comes to three. So roughly a three a diopter uh, corneal astigmatism will correspond to a seven uh, diopter inter the, the, the T7. So um, this is the rule of the thumb. You try out with all the all these uh, T, you know, to starting from T2 to T9, you know, this thing uh, works pretty well. Uh, I think, Arup, the different companies may have different uh, nomenclature. So simple is whatever is in the IUL, nearly two-thirds you will get at cornea. Yeah. yeah. So the IUL, if it is 1.5, you will get one at cornea. If it is 2.25, you will get 1.5. If it is 3, you will get around 2, 2.06 something. So two-thirds of it will be on the Oh, yeah. So another point I think so we need, uh, need uh, needs to emphasize is most of these modern formulas, even the commercial formulas, and definitely Barrett formula and uh, the holiday formula, etc. The toricity factor is already taken into account. So you really don't really have to adjust, uh, you know, the the toricity ratio whether you're dealing with a long or short axial right. length or or a steep or a or a flat cornea. So that is the advantage of the online calculators. And, and but uh, but Arup, still I feel we whenever I am dealing with a high myops where the power is coming say minus uh, three or minus two plus two plus three, I usually target is still minus one or minus one point five. If patient is getting a, a spherical power of say minus six, I will target minus two. If it is getting say uh, plus four, I will target minus one point five minus one. So still I feel whenever there's a higher number you still have, and the same is true for the plus. When I'm getting a 36 diopter, then I'll still target minus one because the minus gives you a cushion and minus at least, and I've still found that they are not very accurate at the extremes and there are chances of these patients becoming hypropic. They are at least more than 50% error in extreme of the eyes. So I target on the minus side. So far as this is my experience has been on the extreme of both the sides, I will target minus. Okay. 
So regarding the last question, I know, I mean, as I had just mentioned uh, the previous slide, you know, I mean, if the uh, couple of consecutive studies have shown that you know, swept source biometers uh, give more uh, accurate, precise values uh, compared to Schimpfler devices when you're using the Barrett uh, uh, Tory calculator. So the next question is uh, regarding which calculators to choose. So we have had a discussion on that. So uh, still uh, when there are multiple uh, online calculators, so which is at present the preferred uh, toric calculator, sir? Barrett. So Barrett is no doubt the, you know, the gold standard. Uh, nowadays for spherical calculations, I'm using Kane, Barrett U2, as well as EVO. EVO. But when it comes to Toric, Barrett Toric calculator is really the best. You know, uh, recently, about I think last two to three years, uh, I have been also checking up with uh, the Ken uh, formula. And the Ken formula has uh, it seem, it seems to have done extremely well in post RKIs and keratoconic eyes and in a post refractive surgery eyes. Yes. And another beauty of the Ken formula, Ramesh, I mean, if you have noticed it carefully, you know the SI factor is zero, so it it is it That's is true, it, true, true, Aro. Exactly. <laughs> it is uh, a I very been, user friendly uh, formula. Very yes, uh, Aro. But I have been using an SA of zero for the last six seven years. I am very happy. If you all keep SA as zero, we can move forward a big step. We should not bother about SA. Yeah, I never bother about SIA. Yes. As, whenever I started the incision with 2.2, because I usually prefer incision a little posterior, closer to the limbus where it little bit oozes. So uh, 2.2 actually makes no difference. Well, according to Ken, it is 2.75 millimeter incision to, and the zero uh, center of the SIA is, uh, is okay. Yes. So, yes. I mean, it, it makes it very simple actually. So we all go with the uh, centroid the SIA value of 0 to 0 0.1 and uh, yeah. It works for any incision between 2.2 and 2.8 millimeters. Yes. So our next question is on how important is the ocular surface evaluation that was very lucidly covered by Dr. Chandrasekhar. So my query is also regarding contact lenses. So if the patient uh, is wearing uh, contact lenses, so how long should we ask them to discontinue and come for the biometric uh, measurement? Yeah, very, very important question. Uh, so if it is a non-toric contact lens, uh, they have to discontinue for one week. But if it is a toric lens, uh, toric contact lens, then what I do is that I take two K readings three weeks apart. And if I feel that uh, there are still some signs of warpage and the K is shifting, then in toric contact lens, I may wait even longer. Couple of weeks, I think two to three weeks. And then, then uh, you you measure, uh, you look for the reproducibility in the values yes. to subsequent readings. Yeah. And uh, uh, we would like to know whether there is a role for aberrometry in uh, toric IOL planning. I don't use it. I have no idea about. I don't use it, also, Doctor. Yeah, so even I don't use it. Uh, it's uh, an I'm upcoming. Uh, uh, so none of us are using it, but you know, I mean, uh, I think there are people who are using it. In the Western world, and uh, they, uh, I think it's a becomes a theoretical discussion. Okay, we'll uh, go to the next set of questions, which are uh, regarding the intraoperative uh, issues. So we discussed regarding the site of incision, whether to go. Doctor Ramesh uh, re-emphasized that always going for a temporal incision is best because uh, we know there are so many factors. No, but the only thing is when you suppose there is a, you feel that you are putting an IUL which is under correcting 0.25 or something, then you can, if it is possible to place your incision at a steep axis without inconvenience to you, and so that you can make a 2.753 millimeter incision, it can correct that amount of astigmatism. So you can place, when, I mean, otherwise you don't have to plan big, but if it is something around 0 0.2, 0 0.3, you feel you are getting under corrected. And make it in 10 or 20 degrees this way or that way. You can do. So I, I would like to just uh, uh, have, I just share a different point of view. And that point of view is that in any given patient, we really don't know what the, our SA is going to be. It varies from patient to patient for the same surgeon. And the variation is more if you are not temporary corneal. 
So if you, if I if I enter in the oblique or superior axis, my variation is going to be much more than if I enter on the temporal corneal. So in general, for the beginning surgeries, better to stick on to a temporal corneal for the next uh, yeah. 100 or 200 yeah. But Dr. Ramesh, actually, most of, luckily, most of the corneas we operate in the old days are have the temporal steepness. So 10 or 20 degree, and 80, 70, 80% of the patients will have the temporal steepness. And, uh, and 10 or 20 degree of this way, that way is uh, very much possible. And uh, many times the lenses are also not available. And as I told you, these are the modifier. These are not planned. So when I got to choose between the two, 1.75, 1.5 or two. So if I'm getting 1.5, I want to have 0.2 more, I'll put an incision at a steep axis. So use them as a modifier, not as a primary uh, target. In this context, Nirupama, there's another question. Like you see, SICS is the uh, most popular method of cataract surgery in our country, in the developing world. So would, is it compatible with the torical implantation? Ramesh and uh, Dr. Harbansh and uh, Chandrasekhar, Nirupama. I think all SIS are not, or all SICS surgeons are not the same. There is a small group of superb surgeons who are able to get predictable SIA. And for them, probably it will make a big difference. But for an occasional SACS surgeon like me, I, I will not be doing it. So, Tori Kyle and SACS, they do not go hand in hand? Uh, unless you are a superb SACS surgeon. Okay. Uh, sir, our next okay. question, uh, question is regarding uh, low toricity. So, should we go for uh, toric IOL or uh, still there is scope for uh, OCCI and LRI in the management of lower cylinders? So the, if we talk of the toricity, the toric I will always gives performs better and more predictable than uh, OCCI and LRI. But out of the OCCI and LRI, OCCI is more stable. I mean, uh, the at least the like incision, the vision will get stabilized in three weeks, four weeks time. While LRI initially may give a lot of excitement and a good correction, but slowly and slowly effects is not decreasing. There is more irritation and less predictability. So LRI should be discarded. I got no doubt about it. And even I don't like the FEM2 LRI. I think it is they are just trying to sell the machine by some or the other. If the LRI is not working by incision, it is not going to work by the FEM2 because you're going to create much, much more central incision with the unpredictability. So the nomogram of the LRI when we were doing also, I had done a full thesis on this. I had done a full thesis on OCCI with the 3.5 to 5.5 millimeter incision. OCCI is definitely better than LRI. But again, if in the modern time, it is better to use as an enhancer. And uh, OCCI is another big point is OCCI, if any patient is unsatisfied with your outcome and you don't have access to the laser to correct his uh, reflective surprise. Say so patient has got minus one. OCCI is a very simple. You find out the minus cylinder axis and parallel to that, you give to incision 90 degree away. And you can correct up to one diopter, 0.75 diopter of cylinder without having any access to any equipment or any machine. Yes, sir. It can be used post-operative modifier. Can you combine it with the toric IOL? Yes, yes, hundred percent. Because sometimes when I get a patient of trauma who has got say eight adapter, and I am getting the lens which can correct only six adapter, so I want to have a little more additional effect. You can give, and I don't give OCCI incision or more than four millimeter incision. Earlier I have done studies on five point five, and so now I restrict myself to three point two millimeter incision or three point five millimeter incision, and a little more uh, corneal and manipulate the another incision hardware. Just don't pass the instrument there. When you're doing irrigation, aspiration, at least put an infusion from the other side. So a little bit of manipulation of that incision is recommended. And then you can have a good effect. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And uh, the next question is, uh, how do we manage uh, intraoperative pupillary constriction when we have already planned a toric IOL case? And during the end of the surgery, especially the IA or the IOL implantation, the pupil constricts. So how do you go ahead with the implantation? So I, I think this should not be an issue because only thing you need a people uh, to see whether your lens is placed correctly. Placing the lens is not a problem 
once everything else has been removed. So you can use the any hook to pull the iris away and see whether lens is well placed or not. So normally I will uh, put nothing to dilate. I mean, of course you can do the put the pinocane, which is available now, is very good because I've been using Jalocard with Adeline for quite some time. And recently, what I found is that after putting Jalocard Adeline, if I'm getting say five millimeter of dilatation, then I put on a pinocane slowly and slowly over four five minutes time, I get one millimeter more expansion with the pinocane and a little sustained and delayed as compared with the Jalocard and Adeline, which I was using. And of course, you can use the sodium alnate and a thick viscoelastic to stretch it. But normally, I will not put the hooks and rings for this. Oh, okay. But Whatever. if there is a preoperatively poor midriasis, then can we plan a toric IL with an expansion? Yes, yes, hundred percent. Okay. Without any doubt, use. I, I think the rings are better, but the hooks are equally good. And Patna Charji ring is now very economical, and uh, I think there is no reason not to. The yeah, I mean, I think but the, the, the butter charge is being advantage is that you don't lose the anterior chamber. You know, you, you can even take it up through the paracentesis incision. So you don't have shallowing of the, the anterior chamber with forward movement and rotation of the lens. So only thing I'll say is whenever you're putting these rings or hooks, there should be some viscoelastic between the eyes and a capsule. Normally, if you put on a viscoelastic on top, iris gets stuck to the capsule. And particularly if you are doing midway surgery, when your excess has been already made, then you must ensure some viscoelastic between the uh, capsule, anterior capsule, and the iris. Otherwise, you will hold the capsule over there. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, is there any role for uh, placing a CTR when we are planning a toric IOLs for high myopes because the uh, expanded bag may cause increased rotation? And if so, what is the cutoff axial length when you would put a CTR along with the toric iron? So I think CTR, when you put it, it will not prevent the immediate rotation of the lens because you are making actually the capsule is stressed and is smooth as compared to the crumble up over there. It is only the post-op contracture may help. So in my in most of my cases, like you when you do dissect. You put on an air, big air bubble to press the lenticule against the cornea and then you release the air bubble. So same way, what I do is I put on a very big air bubble inside the eye and press the lens against the posterior capsule. And you keep it pressed there for a few minutes because these lens are very sticky. Even when you want to rotate it, they don't rotate very easily. The only problem is when you are trying to put it over there in the first place, whether you are able to put it at the right place or not. But you put on an air and do not uh, deepen the chamber too much. Most of the time, we try to measure the IOP when we are leaving the patient from the table. So instead of measuring the IOP, keep the iris flat. Do not push the iris behind because when you're putting the iris behind, the capsule is getting extended, distended. If the capsule is distended with your fluid, it will have more tendency for the lens to rotate. You have to flatten the capsule, keep the IOP soft, put on a big air bubble to press it down and don't leave a leaking hole. I don't think you will get a problem of rotation. So the consensus is uh, even in high myops, don't use a CTR? I mean, I, I, no, no, I, so I have a CTR we can use, but rotation, whether it will affect or not, I'm quite, is a doubtful. You can use CTR to flatten the capsule, but whether it will prevent the rotation, I think it is the important is that on table, the cap lens should be pressed against the capsule well pressed against the capsule. And if it is like, if you suppose you try to rotate lens in a softer bag, you will not be able to rotate well, or no, it will get stuck somewhere. If the bag is extended, the lens will rotate freely. So if you put, if the IOP is more, if the bag is extended, the lens will rotate. But if the IOP is soft, the air is from the top, pressing it down, the capsule bag is not extended, the lens will not rotate. CTR is not because CTR is in any case is increasing the capsular size. It is not decreasing. How it is going to decrease it? It is making it tighter where the things on a tighter surface, you can move much more smoothly. I saw one of the presentation where they was talking about the, the rug, you slip more if it is tight. Uh, I mean, the, so the, the thing is the CTR will not prevent immediate rotation. Immediate rotation. Ramesh, your point? Uh, yes, sir. When they when when this topic came up, I think they were talking not about the regular CTR that we use, but about the Henderson's Henderson ring, which has got a, yeah. a, a rippled baby surface. 
and yeah. the in, and the torricans is supposed to lock on to that but i have tried to ask our indian manufacturers to make it but nobody could do it for me so how it does work i have done it only once in some patient there's no cut off but he had a very large anterior segment and a high myope so i put a put a ctr inside but left the trailing uh, the eyelet out and I, then i put the uh, uh, toric lens and tied the two together so the trailing haptic of the toric lens was tied on to the ctr edge and then both were dropped into the bag <laughs> it dragged quite a bit and then i i, I could uh, why don't upload like, that video ramesh it will be very interesting for us to see uh, it is there somewhere aru that is the time when when I, when i lost my laptop i think i told you i spilled some drink during the uh, onto my laptop and a bunch of my videos went off so if you tie it together and then you put it into the capsule bag the whole thing becomes quite uh, uh, it doesn't turn so easily and then you, then you can move it to the final axis so put them together but 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 tie the trailing haptic and the ctr together that's very inno- innovative so in this context you know i mean i i would also like to ask the panelist and uh, nirupama is uh, is the rotation more in uh, with the rule kind of astigmatism or oblique astigmatism when you or it is more with against the rule astigmatism what has been your experience yes. arub my personal experience is that if you place it horizontally that's why one, one of my tips for the beginning toric surgeon is please go for the atr and it will be in the 0 180 axis it won't rotate so much but more important i find that some lenses tend to rotate some of them don't rotate so choose the lenses which don't rotate much in your hands all toric lenses are not the same what so about the person you feel the putting the air and pressing it over there is more important than anything else what about the hydrophilic toric lenses hydrophilic acrylic toric lenses what has been your experience with this campaign uh, in comparison I'm, I'm with the use any one of them so i really don't know but they should be okay i don't think there should be any problem in it i felt that the, the plate haptic toric lenses were very very good uh, until you choose a a, a myope with a large bag at, at that point they tend to more on the bit but uh, the hydrophilic plate haptic torics i used a few they were all quite good okay and uh, sir uh, any experience with the using uh, the markerless uh, toric eye uh, image guided tools like the callisto eye or verion our uh, query was whether this can be used under peribulbar block or is patient fixation necessary uh, when we use the image guided system uh, patient fixation is not necessary okay So, but even if the patient is asleep and the, the eyeballs roll will it uh, still give the values or it may show some error the if uh, i use verion i do not have any experience with callisto as long as the you know there is a dotted circle if you match that with the limbus uh, most of the times you are bang on target okay sir Actually, in the, in this context, as a parallax sometimes may be a big problem. You know, when at the end of the surgery, when you're closing, and you just want to have a last minute look whether you are uh, whether you are aligned to the steep axis or not. The parallax comes into the picture. So I'd like to get an opinion from all three of you. Uh, have you experienced it? And uh, if if so, then how how do you tackle it? Yes. Pa- see, parallax is definitely going to be there. Uh, it is because the Yeah, uh, you know, Verion, you know, projects the image on the retina, uh, on the cornea, whereas the lens is deep down into the anterior chamber. So, as long as the line joining the dots on the uh, lens is parallel to the um, marking on the projection, the projected marking, I think we are bang on target. We are quite on target. Yeah, uh, I think uh, Arup Pajay already talked in my this thing. we should also have a side to air one is very important if i am putting at 20 if i have to have the error whether it should be towards the 15 or towards the 25 so that whenever you have got any doubt you know which is the on the safer side to go so and secondly many a times when you are doing uh, not in a very on when you are marking your ring may not be placed equidistant from the center and you, when you mark one mark is aligned another mark does not get aligned so leave both the marks either put the ring and check again or leave both the marks equally away from your uh, lens 
Because suppose you are lens uh, marking ring has shifted onto the one side, then both the marks may not be going through the center. Yeah. Okay. Ramesh. Uh, uh, Arup, I, I do the same way as Dr. Chandrasekhar. The, uh, the reflex from the lens optic and from the cornea should be aligned. So uh, at that point, uh, I will check whether, whether the axis is yeah. correct or not. They will be parallel. They have to be. Yes. Yeah. And uh, now coming to the post of uh, considerations. So which design rotates the least? I think Dr. Ramesh has uh, mentioned uh, the, the hydrophobic is better over hydrophilic or they are the same and also the haptic sir you said the rotation is less with the plate haptics is there any no 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 the specific comment that i made was the alcon toric rotates least in my hands that's a specific comment and if you're using a plate haptic it is great for normal and small eyes but it is okay. not good for the large bats Oh, but the rotation is more with uh, plate haptics, sir, when compared to the in, loop haptics. In large, in large bags, in large bags, they both will rotate. Okay. The plate haptics are great if the bag is small or normal in size. But the J loop, most of our toric lenses are J loop. But the J loop from J and J, from Alcon, from Apasame are not the same. Although the design looks similar, every one of those lenses will behave differently inside the eye. So whichever works well in your hands, you should use. Uh, I think the using J and J without any problem. I said the the biomechanics of the J and J toric of the was little different. Then now they have come up with the toric two, isn't it? So uh, yes. so which way the the external surface of the haptics are supposed to be frosted? I haven't used them. I have used only Alcon. But uh, I've, so I've been using it. In fact, uh, many times I do hydro implantation. I find the rotation difficult. So the, the these lenses, the new one uh, don't rotate that much because of that. The new ones are much better than the old ones. Are they are more they, yeah. they drag on the capsule, but it still takes a very long time to release and to and to open up. <laughs> Isn't it? Uh, yes. So if there is a misalignment again, there will be difficulty to rotate the lens, sir. That's what. Uh... You, you are no, talking no, no, post stop. Uh, post op, if we have to re rotate the lens, then will there be again any? No, no, difficulty? no, no difficulty. Uh, in the post operative period, we should wait for at least three weeks for the back to become tacky and shrink a bit. So, if, if the, the initially the lens turned because it was capable of turning. Yes. So, similarly, if you rotate immediately post op in the first day or two, it may still do the same. So, ideally, you must wait for two or three weeks, let the back shrink a bit and become sticky, and then it should. Yeah, yeah, yes. And sir, post-operatively, if there is uh, inadequate power of the toricity, so what is our next uh, line of action? So should we go for an IOL exchange or the bioptics? Like See, the, 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 that depends upon bioptic will be always better because whatever may be the region bioptic will take care of the refraction, which may be a little different from the corneal astigmatism, whether it's a lenticular action, whatever may be the region Bioptics will yeah. take care of everything. Secondly, once you put a lens, if there's a little bit of fibrosis and if the patient is late beyond, say, six, eight weeks, and if you are planning at that time, and then maybe single piece lens may be very, very difficult to place at an exact location. And beyond three months, of course, single piece lens, toric, you won't be able to place it. So the, instead of exchange, it will be better because, again, you are doing an intraocular procedure. So the, the laser is much more cheaper, economical, and can take care of the patient's concerns far better. So I'll go for bioptics, not a toric IOL exchange, not a toric. I mean, if I like in an irregular cornea where the like I showed you where there's this, you can't do bioptics, there's no other option, but not creating the toricity is entirely different. But in a simple, a straightforward case, the laser is far better option. Any other opinion on this? We'll go to the next question. Yeah, I mean, not exactly on this, but you know what uh, Dr. Harban had uh, shown beautifully about how he calculates whether he's just going to rotate or the lens uh, you know, has to be exchanged. You know, I think, sir, it is basically important to find out the spherical equivalent of the, uh, the uh, post op refractive surprise. If it is closer to zero, most of the time, by just by rotation, you know, we should be able to give a satisfactory outcome for the patient. No. 
or what i was trying to emphasize because many times uh, maybe patient has come you are not treated with dry eye and what or maybe the region we need to find out whether this rotation of the eyeball is going to correct the asymptotic or not so what is as whether because of your incision because of your site protrusion and because of the patient pathology whatever might have happened in between mm. so what is the asymptotic today and whether this lens which is inside the eye can correct the asymptotic what patient is having now only then you should try to realize what a patient had a three cylindrical power and your lens can correct only 1.5 and 1.5 error there is no point of adjusting it so you need to find out whether this lens is capable of correcting the asymptotic patient is having now and how much it can improve upon and again how much it is off axis if it is suppose only 5 degree off axis you put on a lens which was supposed to correct 10 and it corrected it it has huge number of correction and the off axis is only 5 degree which you won't be able to do it you won't be able to show so and the lenses always work best in a steep axis forget about whatever anything what is the calculation you don't have to worry about anything just put the lens on a steep axis you will get the maximum correction this is where we started even if the lens is inside how is going to change these things so the lenses work best when they are placed on a steep axis finish so one single line and you need to find if i put into the steep axis whether it will correct whatever i want or not very simple you don't have to have anything else put the lens on a steep axis you will get the best outcome and whether putting a steep axis is possible if it is rotation is 5 degree it is not possible if it is more than 10 degree it is possible and put on steep axis and then you need to find out whether putting it in steep axis will benefit me or very simple you don't have to i really can't understand why we need to do anything else because put the lens on a steep axis you get the optimum result so uh, a, a different take on the same problem no we have a power and we have an axis and behind that we have one more lens with a different power and a different axis so the interaction of these two when they are misaligned is is not is not very is not simple it's a little more complex sir has understood it in a in a very deep manner but those of us who are beginners and for whom we we are not able to uh, we don't have that uh, that mind that kind of a brain or that understanding i suggest that you go to barrett's rx calculator there you have to input what lens you have put and what the uh, error is and what the k is and it will tell you whether turning it a little bit will help or whether you have to exchange uh, even the ask Astigmatism as fix dot com also does the same thing, you know. Yes, this is it, slightly. Oh yes, 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 sir. This is the uh, uh, this one is being updated more frequently. Yeah. So, uh, but it, it also does the same thing. No, no. For the simple minded, this is one of. Hey, Doctor Ramesh, I really uh, tell me why why it is difficult to understand what is the steep axis now. Tell me this: if you do a pentacam and keratometry now, you will know what is the steep axis. Do you agree that the if you put on a toric eye on a steep axis, it gives the optimum result? Sir, I mean, often, the conclusion? often the axis at which I'm implanting is not the steep axis, sir. It is like 15 degrees or or the 5 degrees or 7 degrees, a uh, different from the steep axis. So the corneal measurement in my eyeball mass is 700. Will be saying, uh, we'll say point. I mean, the uh, 1.27 into 17. But it asks me to implant at 13 or or at 20 or or some other axis. There's a small difference, sir, between the steep axis and what. the calculator tells me to it tells me to implant why so, why should be so yeah uh, i actually don't understand it sir so, uh, so the, the the whatever is the calculation until is there are so many confusing things you are taking posterior corneal presumed or something you are presuming you are presuming the incision otherwise if this is the This is the mount. This is the plat. I mean, very simple. I mean, where was the steep axis? I want to put the. I, I I I think the way it is it is taught is this. I'm not sure, but this is my my way of thinking. When we look at the K reading and we say 44 into 180 and 43 into 90, we are having two axes. But when you look at a topographic map of the cornea, every point has got a different K. And if you take the if you take the posterior cornea. The three millimeter axis and the K is different. The five millimeter axis and K is different. The seven millimeter axis and K is different. So we are having two aspherical. So so the, the, so my my yeah, yeah. my take on that is. So I I'll, I'll just com complete. We are having two aspherical surfaces which are which are misaligned. They are not aligned. Now 
the how the uh, calculators work is they see the results of let us say 20 patients with this kind of an uh, of an alignment and they fine tune it and they say okay we will it's going wrong by 5 degrees we will change it by 5 degrees and then they see uh, they see 10 or 20 more patients with the same kind of misalignment and they keep on refining themselves so it is not simply that i have a k here and that has to be the same every k at every zone no, no, I, I don't think they do any refinements because you do on a IO calc, you put on a different keratometry, you'll get the same value with different values. What I'm, I'm, I'm coming to that. So what is important is to understand your own topography map. Whenever you see any pentacam reading in the central one millimeter, there'll be hardly any asymptotism. So the, and you need to keep the patient's pupil in mind. Our Indian population's pupil is very small, uh, two millimeter, three millimeter. So I personally feel that for us, two to three millimeter is the best, not four millimeter or 4.5 millimeter of the pupil size, which the best follows. And secondly, in a pentacam reading, the wherever you are getting the maximum asymptotes, usually suppose the one millimeter will be small, two millimeter will be little more, three will be little more, four will be around three, four millimeter, then it will asymptotes keep on decreasing. So the highest asymptotes you are getting on a pentacam and the total corneal power and the axis you are getting is most likely going to be correct. I don't think any of the formulas understand. They just, you try to put in different pentacam. I don't think they take into the consideration. They ask you, uh, you put different patients. I don't think they are very intelligent. Uh, they have got any artificial intelligence built in except Hill RBF, which keeps on finding out the similar data of the different patients, whatever, and then tries to give the without calculating what it could be. All other are very simple formulas. Find a little bit of adjustment here and there. That's it. It's not something very great that they are calculating the pentacam value of the four points. No, they are not calculating the pentacam value of the uh, different meridian. No. So they are just calculating what you are feeding them. And most of them do it on the basis of the optical uh, biometer. So I feel that if you start analyzing your data today, you would realize that what I'm talking makes sense that you need to keep the patient's pupil in mind, that what is the pupil size? If you get an elderly patient, 80 years old, one millimeter pupil, even if you don't put toric, he will see well. So you, you see the toricity of that. And secondly, when you do the auto refractometer, and I have found many patients who had a spectral refraction, but had no corneal uh, toricity. And then post-op, and I didn't put a toric, I will, they had a, a cylindrical power in their specs. So if you start analyzing your data, you will find that even this refraction makes a lot of difference. And even the you see the auto refractor keratometric reading comes much higher than the patient's acceptances. Because if you do the dilated AR, the, the automated uh, refractometer may be taking a much larger diameter than the patient's pupil is. Patient's pupil is say 1.5 millimeter, 2 millimeter, AR is taken at 3 millimeter. And you'll find that the AR is coming 1.5, but patient is quite happy with 0.75. So the, the thing is we need to analyze our own data and we need to see each and every point ourselves instead of, this is what I do. I do not rely upon any one of them. I do my own calculation and I'm, I have been most of the time dot on, dot on. Perfect, sir. Yeah. So I'll, I'll go and analyze Barrett and you also analyze whether they take different points of the pentacam into the consideration. They have taken a standard posterior corneal curvature. That's it in Samas have proved that the total corneal power of the pentagram is better. And because I talked earlier also that oblique axis, you definitely have to have the posterior corneal curvature measured because whenever there is axis to oblique, the posterior corneal curvature will have more influence or more effect. That's where the Barrett goes wrong. So the total, if you have access to the pentagram, total corneal power is better for you, the axis. And then you need to see the pupil size. And according to that, you take the asymptotes. What I also realize, most of the time, the maximum asymptotes you are getting, so zero, two, three, four, five, the maximum cylindrical power you are getting, that axis is probably more accurate. That axis is probably more accurate. And you can, and but if you are getting optical biometer, which is matching with the two millimeter of the pentagram, I'll go with that reading. So we have got to see the agreement where it is coming. I think uh, uh, we will move on to the next uh, set of questions because we are all close to uh, uh, 9.30. Uh, th these are the questions which have, I think we've already covered uh, inside at some point in time. So, so the next set of questions want... are quite interesting. Yes, sir. we wanted to know whether the calculation errors are more with the extreme axial length eyes or with the high cylinder. So in your 
already has been covered. We've already done this. Next page. So the next is next uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, toric IOL implantation in a patient with pterygium, which is causing astigmatism, but uh, not necessary to do the pterygium surgery. So can we go ahead with toric IOL implantation, sir? If it's just a small uh, pterygium, but it's causing astigmatism on the cornea. If we do a manual K on these patients, we will know whether the central zone is affected by the pterygium or not. Based on that, you should decide. I don't think we can go by any of the instruments. But if, if the, it is atrophic and not causing, and you, I mean, the, if it is not required to be removed, then you can go ahead with the toric iron. If it is not very fleshy, not very young patient, very old patient, whether you are not planning for the pterygium surgery, probably you can go ahead with the toric iron. Otherwise, the pterygium should be operated first and then it should do the cataract surgery, not simultaneously. Yes. And uh, the last question was uh, regarding the use of toric IOLs in irregular corneas, which was again covered by your presentation. Uh, and uh, have you any experience with the post DALC patient, sir, and toric IOL? Yeah, my daughter has done it. And, but uh, again, whenever the cornea irregularity is a lot, I think the refractive power and spectral correction has to be given due importance. But she does the corneal surgery, so she handles those patients. But keratoconus I have done, and post RK I have done plenty of them, more than 100 cases of post RK. Yes, sir. Any more questions left, Nirupama? Uh, this is the last uh, question. Yeah. Okay. So I think uh, we have uh, sp uh, spent a long time talking about the various facets of uh, toric IOL. So we started from basics, then went on to special situations, and then the question and answer session. These questions came from all over the country. So I, I, I feel that we have been able to, you know, uh, do some justice to the topic given to us. And I would like to thank uh, all of you, all the speakers, Dr. Harbans Lal, sir, Dr. Ramesh, uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar, Dr. Nirupama, and uh, the uh, Sai and Manjula from Nimaratek for, you know, for making this whole uh, uh, Zoom platform, making it available and sending out the periodic emails and links to all members of All India Ophthalmic Society. So thank you very much. Till we uh, meet uh, next time, sometime in the not to distant yes, future. Thank you, Arup. Thank you, Dr. Ramesh. Thank you Thanks, for a wonderful discussion. Sai, you. Sai, can you take a picture? Sai is there? Uh, yeah, we do that. Can you stop sharing? Yeah, yeah, we just take a picture of all. You also can come in, no, Manjula? Doctor? <laughs> take a picture, you know? Sure, Doctor. Where is Sai? Sai can't, uh, we can't see Sai. I am actually outside, Doctor. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. There is a car. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yes, okay. okay. Amazing. Take, take a picture of all of us. Yeah. Done, doctor. Okay. Thank, thank you, you, thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bye bye, everybody. Thanks, Chandrasekhar. Thanks, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Nirupama is all the way from UK now. She's doing it. Yes. What oh, is the time now? Uh, uh, it's uh, now five o'clock, sir. Five p.m. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very nice. Which part of UK are you in, Nirupama? I'm in Wolverhampton, sir. I came here for uh, Wolverhampton. Wolverhampton. Uh, I came here for a three-month ICO-sponsored observership. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, so right. I came uh, last month. So I'll be here. Nirupama actually is the head of the department in Jipma right now. You know, they have a very young head, with very mature, uh, I mean, uh, on young shoulders. Very mature head on young shoulders. <laughs> I think they'll be learning a lot from her, Alok. Yes, uh, but, uh, they have back. an open mind. They'll be learning a lot from her. Yeah. Mm, thank well you done. so much. It yeah. was a wonderful oh. discussion today, really. Uh, thank you. And really Dr. Harbans Lal is amazing. Yes, totally amazing, sir. <laughs> no, no. See, Dr. Yes. Harbans, what happens is whenever he gives a talk, either his Zoom doesn't work or the previous speakers have taken has taken away his time. <laughs> so I told I him, sir, today it is an open field. It is all yours. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank mind you. blowing. But, uh, but actually. Uh, uh, Honestly speaking, actually, I think more than actually read. So well, most of the time, maybe I'm not in tune with the other things. Like I did the IOL calc and I find out that it was no big brain. 
just to put on a chromatography of the pentacam it will give the same reading they have no calculation for the rk like the live streaming has stopped no nothing huh? no no sir you continue i'm just asking side to stop